what I didn't under, understand uh, before I started researching this is that um, after the First World War, uh, all these chemical companies had basically amped up production to keep up with demand. Then the war ended and they had this vast production ability, uh, but nothing to do with it. So the existence of these, com uh, these companies by themselves created uh, their own demand for di diversification. They basically need to come up with new products to justify the existence of their uh, production capability. So that, aided by the discovery of Bakelite, uh, which is basically a forerunner to plastic, and then also the automobile, which created about 100 uh, needs for uh, other different kinds of chemicals. All this sort of came together and gave us the, our new chemical world by the 40s. People thought it was a great thing. Welcome to Cambridge Forum, coming to you live via Zoom. I am Mary Stack, Director of Cambridge Forum, and today we're going to look at a problem which is of growing magnitude around the globe. I refer to environmental illness. There are over 50 million Americans suffering from this um, environmental problem caused by environmental toxins. It's an acute chemical sensitivity that can be a reaction to perfume, pesticide, paint or certain foods and can cause sufferers to experience a range of symptoms, migraines, extreme fatigue or even brain fog. No one is apparently born with this condition and it can often start with a single toxic exposure. But now with over 85,000 chemicals in our everyday environment, danger lurks around every corner. Victims often find their maladies problematic for doctors to treat and hard for others to understand. Sometimes their condition is dismissed by family and friends, so they can feel like outcasts. Today, we have three guests who are going to help us gain a better understanding of this issue, two of whom suffer from environmental illness. Some term this condition multiple chemical sensitivity. Oliver Brody has just written a book on the topic entitled The Sensitives, the rise of environmental illness and the search for America's last pure place. So Oliver, we're going to start with you. You're a freelance journalist who decided to look at this malady and in doing so you journeyed across country with one AI sufferer and on part of the trip was visiting Snowflake, Arizona, which is a place where AIs have created a community for themselves, safe from fear of toxins or the judgment of others. So this new wave of settlers raises some very serious questions about the high personal cost of our modern way of living. And you compare it with other cultural groups like the Puritans who fled to America to escape religious persecution. So is this an over dramatization of the scale of the issue? Why would people trek thousands of miles in search of a safe place to live? Is it an over dramatization? I think it's a fair question. I mean, I, it's a question I, that I ask myself, certainly. And uh, I think a lot of people ask themselves some version of that question, which is how worried should I be here? Um, I think it's one of the conditions of the world that we're living in now that you can never really be, be sure how much danger you're in. Um, the threats have changed, the nature of the threats have changed. And uh, certainly the, um, the prevalence, the ubiquity of chemicals in our environment is one of those threats. So. Um, I think that we have all sort of gotten accustomed to running across these occasional warnings in our news feeds about BPA in your water bottle or phthalates in your Kraft mac and cheese. Uh, they happen all the time. Um, and I think that most of us have just sort of gotten used to the fact that there are some things we're never, never really going to know for sure. So you just plot your course as best you can. And if you can afford it, you buy organic. Um, and you sort of put together a little scrapbook of, uh, of sort of, um, you know, rules for yourself about how you're going to live. Uh, but generally speaking, our sense of where the threats actually lie and how real they are is pretty fuzzy. Um, and uh, so, you know, I had been living this way for a while, like a lot of people. Um, in fact, the first time I felt this, I was, I was living in New York, and it was after 9-11. And anyone who's in New York after 9-11, uh, had a similar feeling, like I really don't know how afraid to be. Like every time a plane went overhead, you'd look up and you, 
you couldn't be sure, you know? Um, and so you either decide to live with that feeling or you decide to get out. And that was one of the reasons that I eventually decided to get out because it was just too exhausting, ultimately. Um, but I do think that if you live with that feeling long enough, it, it, it gives way to a kind of exhaustion. It does, it wears you down. And um, so I reached a point where I really just, I really wanted to get my hands around some little piece of certainty uh, about this subject. You know, what is the, the chemical threat? How real is this? How much of this is being inflated? How much of it is uh, hyperbole? Everyone has an agenda. It's so hard to tell what's going on. So it was around this time that I ran across um, this population of people who are extremely sensitive to chemicals uh, and also in some cases to mold. And there's some interesting connections there, which I'm sure that some of our panelists can speak to. Um, and it seemed, it seemed that they were living in a kind of way that I would live if I took all of these threats absolutely seriously, uh, instead of just sort of trying to manage them and massage them in whatever way I could. Uh, so then I became interested in these people uh, and their take on the world and what it was like to be them. Um, you know, they are fond of referring to themselves as canaries uh, in the coal mine. Um, the coal mine being our, um, our toxic chemical future, I suppose. Um, and I wanted to sort of test that too, you know, how real is that? Uh, I do think that our faith in our own government regulatory agencies is probably at, at an all-time low. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's something else that contributes to this, this uncertainty. I mean, you have a president who came in and, uh, you know, one of his first moves was to say that he was going to dismantle the entire regulatory system. Um, so, you know, there's no longer, you can't really turn to anyone for, for protection anymore, or you can't rely on anyone to watch your back. Um, you certainly can't rely on companies to watch your back. So I embedded myself with this population. Um, and the circumstances were that I was talking to a lot of people uh, in this population, just sort of picking up a vibe, trying to understand how they lived in the world. Um, and my attention was drawn to one character in particular who uh, had kind of a leadership position in this community. Um, they tend to hang out a lot online um, because it's just an easy place for them to commune. I mean, this is sort of the internet at its best or at its worst, depending on how you look at it. It provides a place for people who aren't getting support anywhere else to hang out and support each other. So there's some really vibrant online communities. And in one of these communities, this guy, Brian, was, um, he played a very important role. He was almost like a spiritual uh, guide in a way for the community. Like he, he emoted things for this community that they were unable to emote for themselves, um, which becomes important when you understand just how screwed these folks really are. Um, they're cut off from civilization pretty much entirely, uh, at least the more severely afflicted. And this is an important point that there is definitely a range of sensitivity here. Um, there are some folks who experience uh, a faint sensitivity, um, and there are other folks who um, experience a very, very intense uh, sensitivity that is going to require them to totally alter their lives. So um, the group that I was looking at, um, you know, my, my, my tendency is to sort of look to the extreme to get the clearest picture, and then from that point, try to look back. Uh, so it was in this group that this guy was hanging out and was providing this sort of support for his community, like an emotional resonator, and then one day he just vanished. Um, so this was cause for concern, not just for me, but also other people in this community, because many of them kill themselves. Um, and if you can imagine for a moment what it's like to live on a planet that's it's essentially like an alien planet to you. Uh, a lot of these folks, um, they're forced to leave their homes. They may buy another home and only discover that they can't tolerate that one. Uh, many of them are called runners because they're always on the run, moving from one place to another trying to find some place where they can feel safe. Um, so there was a concern that this guy had uh, taken his life. And uh, I knew more or less where he was. He was on the, um, on the rim of the Grand Canyon um, in, uh, uh, out west. And I also at this time ran across into another guy, who a uh, runner, who was in Aspen, but was heading to LA to see a, uh, a doctor out there. And I asked him if I could tag along, and if we could sort of try to pick up this guy and figure out what happened to him on the way. So that's what we did. Um, and as time went on, my questions kind of developed and changed and they um, became more about trying to understand the nature of this suffering. Um, the more time that I spent with these folks, the more time that I spent talking with them, it became clear to me that the medical establishment 
um, which basically doesn't acknowledge the existence or the reality of environmental illness. Um, in ignoring the illness, they're essentially ignoring suffering itself, which struck me as very weird because it seemed to me that the first job of any doctor is to acknowledge and understand suffering. So if you get to a point where you're not doing that anymore uh, and you're being pedantic about terms or you're quibbling about mind, body divisions or whatever else, and you've taken a wrong turn as a doctor. Uh, so then it started to turn into more of an inquiry about where have we gone wrong here? You know, what's wrong with our medical system? How have we become blind to this vast suffering? Uh, and how should we understand it? You know, should we understand it as something that's strictly physical? Uh, should we treat it as a disease that simply hasn't been discovered yet or understood yet? There's certainly precedents for that, plenty of them. I mean, every disease that we've discovered at one point was a mystery to us. Uh, or should we treat it as some hybrid of a psychological and uh, more physical phenomenon? Or, you know, what are we to make of it? Um, one thing that we know for sure is that chemicals are having an effect on us. Uh, I think just in the last 25 or 30 years or so, uh, thyroid and liver cancer rates have tripled. Um, and uh, similar figures, I think is more like 200% for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and kidney cancer. Uh, autism is up. I think people are familiar with these numbers. Allergies are up. Uh, intellectual impairments on children are up something like 62% or something like that. Um, and uh, there's some frightening studies out about uh, um, male fertility down 50% or something like that. So these are impacts that, that have happened. And no one has been able to trace them directly to um, you know, chemicals. But there's always like talk of this is kind of associated or it's related or suspected. So it contributes to this feeling of fear and uncertainty that we're all living with and a sense of helplessness that we're all just kind of drifting along and we'll go wherever this thing takes us and God help us when we get to the end. Um, so what I wanted to do in the midst of all this was to reconnect with the people who are actually suffering uh, because I think that's where the map needs to start. That's where the conversation needs to start. Uh, and if you're starting someplace else, if you're starting with your insurance codes, you're not doing it right. So. Well, you That's covered a lot of amazing points there. Um, and you've talked about the fact that people that have these problems have, it's a very expensive kind of cost to them in every respect, financially, where they live, emotionally. And I'm going to go straight now to um, Stephen Bodine, who manifests exactly what you're talking about. He actually has environmental illness and he is now living in southern Spain. So Stephen, how and why did you end up in southern Spain? Well, first of all, I, tend, I like to call it multiple chemical sensitivity because I don't feel I'm ill necessarily. I feel it's more a disability in a lot of ways than it is an illness because I can feel very healthy for extended periods of time. And the other thing is why I ended up in Spain is not as important as some of these other issues that you've been talking about. So let me kind of backtrack and talk about them. I mean, what, first of all, to know that uh, Anne is a, a physician and uh, I'm a psychotherapist, right? As well as a meditation teacher, written several books on spiritual awakening and meditation. So I have a very uh, keen understanding of what is um, a clear and settled and peaceful mind, right? And, and so I can say that um, chemical sensitivities have a direct impact on the brain, in my experience, and affect mind states and moods very profoundly. Now, fortunately, I have meditated for 40 years, so I'm able to maintain a peace of mind in the midst of all the ups and downs. But I can tell you from the place where I sit in meditation or in everyday life, the uh, impact on the brain is probably the most significant uh, uh, impact of the multiple chemical sensitivities. Uh, and it, the people who are affected by it may have psychological symptoms, but I would like to suggest that most of those symptoms are actually caused by their illness and not vice versa. So, mm -hmm. and that's one of the arguments that's made by those who are opposed to the diagnosis is, these are people who have psychological problems and that it's just manifesting physically. From my experience, I would say absolutely not, okay? Now, in terms of the movement to Spain, the movement to Spain is the end of a 20-year odyssey 
I wouldn't call myself a runner, but I have bought and, uh, and tried to fix up and sold four different houses in the course of that time, 20 years, costing me you know, tens of thousands of dollars in expenses and resale and lost money, trying to find a home and create a home that I could tolerate. And I was unable to do it. And uh, you know, at great expense, knowing all the different materials, all the different possibilities and permutations, it's very difficult for people with chemical sensitivities to find an environment that they can really tolerate. You know, I ended up living in the desert in uh, Tucson, the other end of Arizona, southern Arizona, uh, and uh, I found that I was really sensitive to the desert plants. They put out a lot of natural chemicals, which I found were really toxic to my body. So even though it was very peaceful, had a lot of space around me, the actual, the desert itself was problematic. So I would say I'm one of those very sensitive people, but somehow I managed to maintain a psychotherapy practice, write a number of books, be a spiritual teacher in, in the midst of that, uh, through an enormous amount of work and, uh, you know, uh, meditation. So I think it's important that the impression that people who are chemically sensitive are malingerers, people who can't cope with life, and therefore they end up the way they end up is largely inaccurate. I know some beautiful creative people who are chemically sensitive and continue to do what they do, but at great expense. Like even being online with you now, the EMFs for my computer, my iPad are causing me to have a headache and you know, affecting my brain. But I do it because I love it and I deal with the expense, right? So I ended up after Tucson looking all over for a place to live. And I have relatives in Spain and discovered that being near the Mediterranean, being near the water, was very good for my body. And here in Spain, fortunately, all the places I've looked at have tile floors. See, carpeting is one of the things that chemically sensitive people inevitably have a hard time with. So I found a place with a beautiful tile floor, a terrace overlooking the Mediterranean at a very good price. I could try to do this on the west coast of California in a good environment, but pay five times or six times or seven times what I'm paying here, right? That's how I ended up in Spain. But 20 year odyssey, during which time I was maintaining a psychotherapy practice, teaching an annual program in meditation and spiritual awakening, and <laughs> trying to deal with my environment. So, you know, it's a, a tremendous task. Um, but, it also uh, sounds like a bit of a solo odyssey. You weren't uh, attracted to the possibility of being in a community where people were in the same well, interesting, because, uh, you know, I looked into the possibility of Snowflake. Snowflake is you know, very well known. But uh, to me, being isolated like that is, you know, it's a fate worse than death. <laughs> I, to me, uh, I would find it depressing to be so, so isolated. And I think a lot of people in Snowflake do end up finding it depressing. And I know of several people who have killed themselves, you know both in uh, Snowflake and other, uh, other communities. So I felt for me, it was very important to be near people and not to become one of those who's isolated. I understand the impulse and the need to do it. And I totally respect and honor that decision. But for me personally, <laughs> I just didn't want to go there. You know? Well, um, that's a very good segue actually to our third guest. Uh, who is a physician, Dr. Anne McCampbell. And she trained in, uh, she graduated from UCLA Medical School and then trained in internal medicine. And in many ways, she was this uh, star. She was a high achiever, living a very productive, I imagine, busy life. And then suddenly she got seriously ill with severe multiple chemical sensitivity in 1989. So she's been a leading chemical sensitivity and disability advocate for the past 25 years. She now works as a health and chemical sensitivity consultant. So welcome, uh, Anne. 
there are lots of aspects of this topic that you are knowledgeable about, uh, obviously. Um, can you tell us very briefly about the trajectory of your illness and why you've chosen to be engaged in advocating and counseling people that suffer from this? Sure. Um, uh, my health, uh, like you said, I was healthy, active in my early 30s and then started to get more tired and reactive foods and and then finally uh, hurt my back and then uh, had some protein powder and then at you know over the course of a week uh, I was completely different and things that I had been breathing the week before and not a problem you know became a problem so I went down hard and fast um, not unusual the course of kind of slowly kind of going down precipitated by events uh, I had a landlord that sprayed the trees uh, with pesticides kind of where I was uh, living I'm sure that didn't help things like that but um, at, in the first six months of when I was ill, I, I thought I wasn't going to make it. And one was because my thyroid went down to almost nothing. And I didn't know if I was going to be able to tolerate a supplement. In fact, I tried one or two and I couldn't. The other was I wasn't digesting food. I could barely eat and um, my weight was dropping. And you know, we might mention, I mean, the lethality of this disease is not just suicide, uh, but uh, people do starve to death. People um, are not able to be treated for things like pneumonia where other people would be treated and you know, get over it. Cancer's another one. Uh, can't do chemotherapy or the radiation and things like that. But when I, uh, and I have to say, yeah, so for all my training, didn't really help me. I never heard of anything like this. What did help me was friends. And I, I was living in the East Bay in California. And there already was an organized group of chemically sensitive people that had a newsletter. And I knew some of them. And I, I knew that they had some issues with a few things. I got it worse than they did. But they were my connection. They hooked me up with the proper doctors and were able to just tell me how to live. How do I cook things? How do I wash my clothes? and things like that. Um, but I pretty much just dedicated myself uh, to trying to raise awareness of this problem, um, you know, if I made it through and I did make it through. And so I have been trying to raise awareness ever since through, uh, you know, different activities. We have the Multiple Chemical Sensitivities Task Force in New Mexico. Uh, we worked with the legislature. We've done things to, we got, um, you know, an MCS uh, proclamation from the governor back in, the, you know, 20 years ago, and work on tangential issues like trying to reduce pesticides, trying to promote integrated pest management, organic landscape, trying to, you know, have more fragrance free, uh, you know, kind of places and offices and things like that. So that's how I got involved. I, I just, I sometimes say I felt like I slipped in an unscheduled episode of the Twilight Zone. I had a life that was going here and it just completely changed. Um, and nothing, you know, my life turned out completely different. But, you know, in trying to sort of roll with it and see is there a way I can bring my medical knowledge uh, to, help, to help people, that's been my approach. It's very interesting that you yourself are a doctor and in some ways, traditional medicine failed you. Um, how do you feel about other people putting their case now? I mean, obviously, how do you get medical coverage or medical disability if this isn't really accepted as a bona fide condition? Right. We, we did a uh, town hall meeting on MCS that actually was um, through a legislative a piece of legislation back in the mid 90s. And we looked at the major problems of people with chemical sensitivity, safe housing being number one, um, employment, you know, number two, healthcare was another big one. And so we got three problems. Doctors don't know about chemical sensitivities and, you know, and this is in general, there are environmental doctors that do know this. Um, they don't know how to treat you. The places that you have to go are inaccessible for all of the, uh, you know, uh, especially sanita sanitizers and things like that. But anyway, the offices and third, the kinds of treatments that may help us more alternative, you know, acupuncture or something like that, rather than a drug is not covered by any insurance that people have. But I think what's really important to, to understand is not just the medical profession 
just kind of overlooking us. The, the, the chemical industry is actively involved in suppressing recognition. And again, going back to the 90s, in their own publication, which is now the American Chemistry Council, they said they're going to work with state medical boards to try to stamp out any awareness of chemical sensitivities. In, in addition, they, uh, they formed a nonprofit called the Environmental Sensitivities Research Institute to spread misinformation about chemical sensitivities because these are the people that manufacture pesticides, uh, carpets, uh, the, the Cosmetic and to Toiletries Association is very actively involved. Um, they've also went so far as try to rename, uh, the, you know, this, um, what is it? I hate it so much, I can't even remember. The IEI, uh, hmm. But anyway, it was to get the chemical, the word chemical out. Uh, oh, idiopathic environmental intolerances. It sounds kind of neutral and benign, but it isn't. They're, you know, by saying, uh, that you don't know what caused it, they're trying to get out of liability. And the other thing is to recognize how much the chemical uh, pharmaceutical industry is connected to the pesticide industry. And you've got something like Bayer, who gave, uh, you know, gases for the gas, you know, to kill people in World War II that turned in, you know, organophosphates that turned out into be insecticides. And um, so, Anyway, there, you know, it's not like, oh, the pharmaceutical industry is going to come up with a pill. They're not, there's no motivation to come up with a pill to help us. Many of us can't take medications, but more, they just want to keep manufacturing their other toxic products. So, um, and what also in medicine, a lot of the conferences are sponsored by pharmaceutical uh, industry, uh, articles, uh, journals, and things like that. And in fact, uh, the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, I think it was Dr. Angel, she actually put her finger on that a while ago. And uh, that, you know, that was useful. But basically, as we're seeing with many things, it's sort of corporate control of everything. And so that's, you know, was uh, one of the things that they tried to do is really suppress people with chemical sensitivities. If I could just throw out a couple things out there in support of what Anne was saying. Uh, the first is that people may not know this, but on average, the chemical industry gives about $100,000 per uh, to, to each Congress person. Uh, that's one little factoid. The second is that in the last 10 years or so, I think this is between 04 and uh, 2013, the chemical industry itself has grown from 1.8 trillion to 5.2 trillion. Um, and there, there's, if once you start looking, you, you just can't stop. Going back to, um, you know, why, why Stephen was having a lot of difficulties uh, with rugs, for instance, if you try to, if you look back to, to how formaldehyde came into the marketplace, it was because people were smoking in bed, sort of a fun link to the, to the whole um, tobacco industry. But even once that threat sort of went away, the formaldehyde folks just kept pushing it and pushing it until there's basically formaldehyde in everything, even though it's not really necessary. So there's some very ugly material here. It would take forever to get into, but yeah, what Anne said. Well, um, last year we did a program with um, uh, the author of the book Whitewash, um, which is her whole you know, campaign for the last 20 years against Monsanto. And it's taken 20 years as you probably all know, to get one successful prosecution in court against Roundup, and that was by a landscaper that has multiple myeloma. And even now they're going back into court to try and reduce and reduce this man's damages because it's such a test case. So when you've got that kind of money, as you say, um, Oliver, thrown to support the chemical industry, it's, you're up against such an enormous wall uh, of deniers. I mean, it's like climate science. There's the, the, you know, this, the system is set up to deny the existence of the problem. So, um, of course, treatment is, is very difficult. I also had a, a personal friend in England who was a vet, and um, she was rather like Anne, very, very busy, very plugged in, um, uh, highly functioning, very athletic. And she was involved in the foot and mouth problem, going around, doing checking farms, spraying. And she suddenly got this 
chronic, chronic fatigue, where in the end she couldn't get out of bed for more than half an hour a day. And she spent, I would say, 10 years. Now, this is a government vet trying to get the condition accepted by the insurance company uh, so that she could work less. They, they said it wasn't a condition, that they, she was a kind of a slacker. They didn't say as much, but they implied it or that she should do a lot of therapy. Well, you know, therapy, talking about treatment now, therapy, of course, um, is helpful, Stephen, I would think, and, and, and you probably agree with that. Um, yeah, but therapy, therapy is helpful to... with the symptoms of the underlying problem, but I think and the the, underlying... you're living in a chemical mm -hmm. war zone and nobody yes. understands you and uh, your life's falling apart. Supportive therapy uh, counseling is of course helpful. That's but it's not, it's as not, a treatment, getting, not as a treatment. Yeah, it's not getting to the root of the problem. Yeah. But you sort of fact, touched on, on something um, there, Mary, which is uh, the role of sexism in, in a lot of this stuff. Um, it's been pretty common. Historically, it's been common that women have been blamed. It's their problem if they get sick. Back in the 1900s, I think, uh, cancer was more common among women, and it was assumed that it was uh, attributable to their greater feebleness. Uh, and you can see similar trends continuing even today. There are uh, a greater percentage of women, uh, and, and, and I think can uh, probably give better details on this, uh, who get environmental illness or multiple chem chemical sensitivity or whatever name you prefer uh, than men. And there are plenty of biological reasons for this. Uh, just to name a few, um, they tend to work more with cleaning materials, with uh, more wake up. They have a bit different biology in like eight different ways. Uh, and yet they are blamed uh, for getting this. Uh, there is a story about one woman who came in complaining to her doctor of multiple chem chemical sensitivity. And his suggestion was uh, go home and have some wine and chocolates. So uh, this speaks to the sort of patriarchal structure uh, of medicine. And uh, there's something about the nature of expertise. There's a point in expertise I find where it, it comes to have a higher regard for itself than that which it was originally intended to address. Um, and so there's a whole history of, of how that has sort of come about in the medical industry. Um, and in keeping with that, there, there's another sort of historical piece in there to throw out here, uh, that every time that medicine has become overly patriarchal or overly controlling, you find that there is sort of this efflorescence of, historically speaking, alternative therapies, different ways of looking at things. Uh, in a book, I trace this back to one doctor in particular, this guy, Benjamin Rush, uh, who in responding to the yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia in the uh, late 1700s, early 1800s, uh, started prescribing very uh, over rigorous, sort of insane treatments, bleeding uh, and purgatives. Uh, but it had more to do with sort of controlling the patient and not being afraid of the patient's discomfort than actually uh, creating any kind of a cure. This guy went on to train about half the doctors in the United States, and according to one scholar, put American medicine back one generation. So mm -hmm. at the same, kind, same time this guy was operating, you had people like Samuel Thompson and, um, uh, I forget his first name, Hahnemann, basically the guy who invented homeopathy. Samuel. Uh -huh. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so it's getting a Thompson's name wrong. But so these guys started getting traction in the American medical scene and elsewhere, and they're prescribing alternative treatments. People flocked to them, not just because they were gentler and uh, took more account of the patient, um, but also because they showed a little bit more imagination and allowed for the possibility that there might be something out there that they didn't understand. So the greatest danger that expertise has is falling under its own thrall. And you see that happen far too often, I think. Uh, one last thing I wanted to mention in terms of uh, the control of the chemical industry uh, over the medical industry, such as it is, is a lot of this has to do with what's taught to kids when they're in med school. Um, and I was talking to a doctor, uh, Michael Gray, down in Arizona. We stopped to see him uh, in the course of our road trip. And um, he, he did some of his schooling in Europe and, uh, I think he said something like currently there's maybe four to five hours in the entire four year curriculum of med school devoted to environmental medicine in Europe. Uh, it's more like 30 or 40. Uh, and a lot of the funding for these med schools comes from pharmaceutical companies. So, you know, the problem sort of begins everywhere. So everywhere you look, you see it. Denmark yeah, has 
institute devoted to the study of chemical sensitivity, actually. So I think the Europeans are much more enlightened to this problem. Yeah. yeah, they also, uh, in England, I know, at Glasgow University, they actually have a chair in complementary medicine. They actually have a chair in that department. So it's not seen as some cocky kind of sideways alternative. It's complementary. Uh, it fits in where mainstream medicine maybe doesn't fill the gap. And I think, as you say, uh, all of you, this is a very multifaceted problem. You all had to try and kind of like negotiate one problem and uh, would the thyroid remedy work then something else was it food was it this it's almost as though you're having to stumble around in the dark yourself to find out actually what sets you off and i think that's complicated by the fact that if there is that many chemicals in the daily environment maybe it's this kind of molotov cocktail of all of them that pushes you over the edge you know i mean that maybe isn't a single toxic exposure i mean you said that stuff you said you didn't have a single Exposure. Yeah, absolutely. And it's very hard to sort it out. It took me years to figure out what I was sensitive to and what I wasn't through a process of elimination, you know, with foods, with environments. Uh, and, uh, you know, my sensitivities remained more or less the same, but it took a long time to s sort it out. And uh, suddenly you're exposed to something, you don't know what it is, and you're having these symptoms, and you have to, you know, scour the environment to figure out what it is. So it, it puts you on a certain edge to a constant sense of a vigilance, which I think we're all experiencing now with the coronavirus, interestingly mm -hmm. enough, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a constant hypervigilance. What's going on in the environment that I have to watch out for? You know? It's true that, that uh, as you suggest, Mary, that, that none of these 85,000 synthetic chemicals that are on the market uh, are tested in combination with each other. Uh, and the vast right. majority aren't really tested at all. Um, part right. of the reason for that is that the regulatory mechanism here just is not robust enough to handle it. That's one part. The second part is that uh, a huge number of these chemicals came on the market where at a time when the regulatory mechanism was just sort of being built and it just couldn't catch up. Uh, so if you look back a little bit farther uh, in the book, there's a little bit of a history uh, that goes, looks into where did all these chemicals come from? Um, interestingly, a lot of it begins with dyes, like synthetic dyes. Um, in a way, you can trace it back to the, the, uh, the cotton industry. You know, when the cotton industry was booming, it meant cheap clothing for everyone, um, but we didn't have an equally cheap way of coloring that clothing. We all wanted to look good, basically. Uh, so the dye industry came about thanks to some 18-year-old's accidental discovery of purple in uh, a London garret, which is sort of a story all its own. But eventually, out of the dye industry grew the medical industry. Uh, mostly in Germany, because they were the first to recognize the importance of chemicals to industry. They were sort of the inventors of the, um, the industrial lab. Um, so the second key character here after that teenager in London is Fritz Haber. The name may be familiar uh, to some. Um, it's, uh, I think Anne was talking about uh, poison gas earlier. This is a guy who basically brought us poison gas during the First World War, chlorine and, and then uh, finally mustard gas. Uh, and his fate is a really dark one. It's worth kind of looking into. What I didn't under, understand uh, before I started researching this is that um, after the First World War, uh, all these chemical companies had basically amped up production to keep up with demand. Then the war ended and they had this vast production ability, uh, but nothing to do with it. So the existence of these, com uh, these companies by themselves created uh, their own demand for di diversification. They basically need to come up with new products to justify the existence of their uh, production capability. So that, aided by the discovery of bakelite, uh, which is basically a forerunner to plastic, and then also the automobile, which created about 100 uh, needs for uh, other different kinds of chemicals. All this sort of came together and gave us the, our new chemical world by the 40s. People thought it was a great thing. But interestingly, even when these first dyes were coming on the market uh, back in um, the 1870s, 1880s, there are people who were writing letters to the London Times saying these dyes, they make my skin itch, it's causing inflammation or whatever. There's one letter, um, there, there's an op-ed, uh, op the editor of the London Times, I think, wrote some sort of notice saying basically, it's too late folks, you know, progress goes forward. We're not going to go back to the old days. And, and to be fair, the old days were, were it wasn't easy. 
because you know you had to squish like seven billion lichens to get a drop of dye or collect two tons of bat guano you know so we got caught in this wave of you know progress or whatever you want to call it and here we are it's interesting you mentioned an important oh sorry Anne. go ahead I just I don't want to I don't want to leave the show be over before clarifying for sure that what I call multiple chemical sensitivity I think that's the best name is a physiologic illness, and the studies that have shown uh, you know kind of is it real or Memorex that show inflammatory markers in the blood of people that are chemically sensitive that is distinct from people that have standard allergies or normals, and and this has been shown in studies in Japan Italy Denmark. Uh, there's another one in Belgium. Um, I think of it primarily as a, um, a neurological problem, um, uh, but the immune system is involved, maybe different for different people, um, and that kind of thing. There's sort of a neurogenic inflammation. And, you know, we, we'd like to know, you know, a lot more. The other thing is, is about the, sort of the epidemiology. You know, one time it was, it was t said that 80% of people that had this were women, but that was when they were looking at people that sought medical care. We all know women seek medical care more than men. So the actual random uh, surveys, uh, random in the population surveys, show a two to one uh, women to men. And that's true. And uh, we did a survey in New Mexico. Uh, they did it in California, same sort of thing. Ann Steineman has done a lot of, uh, of these population studies and um, in, you know, in the US. And the other thing that's interesting, I mean, um, it looks like probably 12, 15 to maybe 30% of the population are somewhat chemically sensitive. So, you know, we're everywhere. I mean, talk about, you know, we're in the, you know, a time of pandemic, but this silent underground epidemic of people with chemical sensitivities has been going on for decades and we're still here. And uh, when we, uh, in New Mexico, we kind of, it's a nice square state and we divide it in, in, uh, in quadrants, which are uh, more the rural area. And in the center is Albuquerque. And what we found was that people that were reporting chemical sensitivities or having, a, you know, uh, and those people maybe don't think of the, themselves as ill. It's like, I, you know, I made my husband change his cologne. I couldn't stand it versus people that really have multiple chemical sensitivities that are ill, probably disabled. Um, uh, anyway, it was equal. It was equal in all four areas of the state, and it, you know it was equal between the rural areas and the cities, because you'd think, oh, the cities are full of toxic chemicals, but you know, out uh, in the rural areas, you have the pesticides, you have agriculture, you have here we have mining, we have petroleum and things like that. So I, I just want to make the point: we're we're everywhere, and and the latest yeah studies we've known that this has been increasing. And, uh, you know, and the, some of the latest population studies are, are showing that. Uh, I think the other thing that's really critical to talk about is the electromagnetic sensitivity. You know, 25, 30 years ago, a few people identified and knew they were um, having trouble with electromagnetics. And uh, it's just increased because that's what's changing in the environment. Some of the chemical pollution is kind of holding still. And the, but the electromagnetics is going up and up and up. And, uh, you know, um, you mentioned that I had written a blog recently about chemical sensitivities and electromagnetic sensitivities in COVID. And, you know, it's a mixed bag. I mean, in some ways, it's the chemical sensitivities uh, dream. Everybody has to stay six feet away from me now. <laughs> and they're not blaming me for being antisocial. And uh, when I wear my mask, they don't stare. Or if they do stare, it's out of pure envy because they see I have a respirator and it seals around, it seals around my face. Um, and we've seen, you know, when uh, things were shut down, the air was so much better, the water is better. But yeah. actually going to like, and all that? Zoom, the electromagnetics with the increasing number of people that are having trouble with that, that's as sort of a looming nightmare along with the 5G that was about to come out too. And along with the use of disinfectants and hand sanitizers right. everywhere. I was, I was say, that's right. one of the real big downsides for people uh, at this time with sensitivities, that they're expected to constantly be wiping and... Yes. And, uh, you know, yes. a big way of taking in chemicals is, ingest, is through our skin, right? Absorbing it. I think a lot yes. of people you know, 
you can't see it isn't there, but actually it is there. So in some ways it has got parallels with COVID, you know, you know, unless you've got really severe respiratory problems, you can actually be walking around with COVID and not know you have it. So um, there is it, it's a bit of an invisible illness in, in some ways. So um, how, do we, how do we kind of go forward with this? I, I'm, uh, I mean, obviously one thing is, is constantly lobbying your local representatives about pesticides being sprayed in schools, on municipal golf courses, um, being vigilant. I mean, as I am where I live, every time they're out there spraying, I say, what are you spraying? I don't want it if it's Roundup. And um, it's hard because, the, as you say, this ubiquitous acceptance, um, Oliver, you said, it's just like, oh, well, you know, what's the big deal? Uh, and that becomes the norm that you, oh, you put up with it, you're a problem when in fact you're not the problem. And um, I'm, I'm jumping now, but for a long time I have wondered, long before people were talking about this, if all the allergies that children have, including the, the increase in ADD, is at least partially responsible to residual chemicals and pesticides in, in food. Because, 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 you know, you know every single child around me that ever had any allergy. Maybe that's pollen. actually how, uh, that's how the, the field of environmental medicine began actually. It began as a, it was called clinical ecology uh, and it was sort of started by this guy Theron Randolph back in the early 60s I think. But even before him going back to, this is going to be the 20s or the 30s, uh, when the field of allergy study was just kind of taking root, there was a, an important split that happened. There were a bunch of allergists who thought that um, you could only have allergies to, I mean, I, I don't have to lean on Anne here a little bit, but I think it's something like allergies, you can only have allergies towards a certain kind of irritant. And then there was another school of uh, allergists who thought you can be basically allergic or reactive to anything. Uh, and because the field was just starting at the time and they were so insecure and they were so desperate to have um, some kind of clinical legitimacy, they made the definition of allergy very uh, tight and limited, uh, and they only spoke to what they knew for sure. That left a lot of stuff out. Uh, and so it took a long time for folks to find a way to start to, to learn how to talk about everything that didn't fall under that very tight rubric. Um, mm. And as you suggest, it was food allergies uh, in the end that I think um, inspired Theron Randolph to create this new category called clinical ecology uh, and to start opening up the optic at, you know, that, that, uh, that we used to look at things. Uh, he was a bit of a rebel. He was uh, at University of Chicago and eventually he got booted uh, out of the university because um, he had a very different way of doing business. Like, so for instance, like if, a, um, if a patient came in to see him, he was known to spend an hour, two hours with the patient um, sometimes writing up to 100 pages just uh, doing the intake. Um, so pretty much every way he had of doing business was very different from the way it was done uh, in medicine uh, at that time. So there's definitely a, a connection between allergy uh, and chemical sensitivity. A lot of it is sort of the framework, you know, how you decide to look at it. Well, I remember back in the 80s, I was working on a food program, um, British food program, and um, the E numbers came to everyone's attention. I don't know if you remember this. So if you looked at food ingredients, which are much more, in, used to be a lot more in depth, I think that America's catching up now, about what was in the product, you would see there was lots of E numbers on British food products. And everybody said, what are these E numbers? And they were colorings and additives that the EEC had just decided to give a number to. So then by law, pressure was brought to bear and they had to name these things because it was found a huge number of children, for example, were allergic to tartrazine, which was in tons of kids' foods, the bright yellow, you know, orangey looking cheesy watsits that kids ram in their mouth all the time. That was full of tartrazine, you know. And uh, then they found out, I remember peas, canned peas had a color in the British market. The same peas in the French market didn't have the coloring. And when asked, they said, oh, British people want really green peas. 
nobody ever asked you if you wanted green peas or colouring in your peas. It was just added. So uh, I think there was a bit more accountability brought to bear after just that one thing. But I think even now there's still a lot of um, ignorance and information kept from the consumer about what they're actually eating. Well, there's about 9,000 food additives on the market right now. And that's up from, I think, 900 from about 50 years ago. So, I mean, if you're in the chemical industry, it's just a fantastic new market. And then we throw the GM into the equation. And of course, that was never tested on humans at all. So now we are the guinea pigs for GM food. And, you know, that I think is really ratcheting up a lot more chemical sensitivities. I think a lot more people are going to be sick because of the long-term effects of GM. And I mean, rats that were fed GM corn just exploded. I mean, they were very sick very quickly and died. So well, of course- yeah. There's, there's a defeatism, I think, that surrounds all of this stuff. Um, and uh, it, didn't, it never started out this way. There was this guy, Heinrich Zanger, uh, who was a Swiss uh, physiologist, I think, back in the, in the, around World War I. And basically, he did his study of the effects of uh, toxic gases on soldiers. Uh, and it was sort of a probabilistic analysis. He's trying to understand this new development that we had cleverly come up with. Uh, but one of the things that he said, he was a friend of Einstein, so he's a fairly prominent figure. And one of the things that he said was that, um, that science needs to keep one step ahead of the risks that it uh, itself creates. Um, and throughout the 20th century, this has been the race. Um, and it was okay for a while, you know, but then the game kind of shifted. Chemicals came on the scene um, and they became ubiquitous. They came into our food. Uh, and then there was, of course, nuclear power um, and... Um, so, uh, you know, Rachel Carson, of course, Highland Spring was the first one who really wrote compellingly about this, but it didn't stop there. It kept going. Um, there's nuclear power and, uh, you know, now it's uh, GM foods and, and uh, it all came to a head in the early 80s uh, in, the, in the Reagan era. Um, actually, you know, the, the, actually, you could say that the paradigm changed even earlier than that. There was this um, a report came out uh, in the mid 70s called the Rasmussen Report. And this was like a, a report on a nuclear reactor. Uh, it was a nuclear reactor study because the feds were required to do these sort of uh, analysis of uh, nuclear reactors to see how safe they were. And the, the report said that basically, yeah, you know, there's a, there's a decent chance that you could die in a uh, nuclear meltdown or whatever, but it's still uh, five times less likely than getting hit by lightning or, you know, three times less lightning likely than getting struck by a car or whatever. He had like a list of threats and risks that you were able to look at and see how much less likely one was from the next. And so this was sort of the dawn of this new idea called acceptable risk. Until then, we didn't really think about it that way. But once you put it in those terms, you're like, well, yeah, okay, I guess I can live with that. It's basically, it becomes this equation in your head. Well, you know, I want to have pretty clothes. Am I going to deal with a rash? Well, okay. Um, and we have become accustomed to this. The problem is uh, what happened in the early 80s is that Reagan got together with a bunch of um, uh, big industry, uh, chemical bigwigs, uh, a serious roundtable of these dudes, and put together a basically a new policy document. It's called the Red Book. And thenceforth, when they were making any kind of evaluation of the risk um, of any chemical policy decision, it had to be a combination of the threat that the chemical posed balanced by all of these other factors, like what could be gained by it or the effect on the economy or so on. So it's at that point where this st stuff starts to become political. And once it becomes political, then whoever has the most political force is going to define how the argument flows. And that's sort of what's happened. So if you're asking the question, where do we go forward from here? I think it starts by understanding what the history has been, how we've got here, and then what we need to do to change direction and take back control of the narrative. Just let me, um, there's a question that's come in from someone or comment. Mm -hmm. Thank you for this conversation. Since childhood, 1970, I've been chemically sensitive particularly to what I know now as VCCs. I believe the following ailments I've suffered from caused by chemicals, menopause a decade early, prior to that, severe fibroids at the age of 47, Hashimoto's, which is autoimmune. All of these have to do with endocrine system and hormones. 
I suspect that non-ionizing cell phone radiation may also contribute to thyroid disease. Not a single person in my family had had any thyroid issues. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this and know of resources, including medical research. Well, I can certainly put um, Anne's details up on our website at the end. She's got a lot of stuff on her. But anyone, do you want to take that, Anne? Uh, you know, I think a, a lot of, uh, well, certainly autoimmunity um, is sort of now known in not the mainstream medicine, but it, for others that is often uh, environmental, environmentally related, um, that uh, your body, your immune system attacks some kind of toxin and then, you know, kind of makes a mistake and, oh, actually it attack, you know, it can attack the thyroid. Um, so certainly autoimmunity is there. Uh, I, I think a, an awful lot of illnesses are related to toxins. And, uh, you know, but, you know, what, what do you do about it? I'm not sure. Um, you know, there are uh, the segment of the medical community that are known as environmental doctors. Many of them uh, are part of the American Academy of Environmental Medicine. And, um, you know, sometimes uh, being evaluated by somebody like that, uh, they might have some ideas for, um, you know, how to, to, to deal with the problems that were mentioned. Well, we can certainly put Anne's um, details on the website. So afterwards I can send them to you. That, that VCC reference there was um, uh, referring to volatile uh, organic compounds. VOCs, I think. I think. So yeah, VOC. So, you know, for instance, that the new car smell that you smell, it's, it's, it's basically the, uh, the aggregate of, of 275 different VOCs, volatile organic compounds. Okay, someone's put, walk me through the supermarket. Where do I encounter pernicious chemicals? How do I avoid them in my food? Well, I would say avoid, yeah, avoid all the E's as much yeah. as you possibly can. Yeah, if you live in Europe anyway, avoid the E's, yeah. Read labels, try and eat organic as much as possible. That would be my And, and unprocessed as much as possible. At the same time, you know, where your produce comes from is very important. Um, even mm. stuff that is so-called organic, um, if it's in an organic field and is sitting next to one that isn't organic, the pesticides can blow right over onto it. Uh, also, you can look online and find out that there are some kinds of fruits and vegetables that are more likely to be dusted with pesticides than others. Uh, I want to say there. strawberries, spinach. Yeah, sure. Anything that's got um, a large set. Yeah. Uh, the other thing, you're, it's not just the food that you get. You're talking about walking through the supermarket. What are you breathing? A lot of supermarkets are sprayed with pesticides. Um, you know, now, of course, now they're all full of uh, sanitizers and disinfectants. So, um, you know, that's an issue, too. We're all going I, to be I would say, where, where's the last place you want pesticides to be? In your food, and that's where they are. And then in places that, get, that uh, you know, uh, they sell food. So restaurants. So the, those are two of the hev most heavily pesticided places. It's upside down. Uh, you know, mm. I wanted to uh, follow up on what Oliver said about acceptable risk. Um, we had a group here of the New Mexico uh, Coalition <clears throat> for Environment and Health. And one of the things that we were really promoting, and we're not the only ones, of course, is the precautionary principle saying it's the wrong paradigm to be saying, what is an acceptable oh. risk? Like we know it's going to hurt make you know, one in a million to have cancer, well, that's okay. Versus what the uh, precautionary principle says is, how can we avoid this? What are the alternatives? And uh, I think that's kind of the way of the future if we can get there. And you know, as far as kind of hope for the future, I have to say, I was extremely upset when the COVID situation hit. And I'm getting emails from you know, uh, anybody I've done business with, the forests, uh, my bank saying, you know, public health is our, you know, people's health is our highest priority, meaning you can't come into our building, but look what you're doing otherwise. And I just, I kind of went nuts really because I thought I've, we've been, the chemically sensitive people have been trying to be the canaries in the coal mine and point out all these problems and it's kind of, you know, not gone anywhere. But um, in the end, what, what I'm hopeful is because all these people were willing to wear masks, all these people were willing to, to change their behavior, that maybe a true focus and concern for public health will come out of this. 
which mm -hmm. would address all the things we're talking about, toxins in food, you know, toxins in schools, uh, and all that kind of thing. I want to just say real quick that I want to back up what Anne was saying here, because I think nothing less than a paradigm change is going to do it. One of the uh, studies that really convinced me to go forward with this book was a study uh, out of Canada that found 137 chemicals in the blood of uh, an umbilical cord, a child not even born. This is Canada, you know? I mean, imagine what you'd find if this was the United States. So the chemicals are everywhere. We're sort of swimming in them. Uh, and to work our way out from the cloud is gonna just require a completely new change in, in how we think about things. Yeah, they found pesticides that are only allowed in Mexico in the air in uh, Canada. You know, these things travel, or the smog that comes from China that blows into California. So these things are circulated around the globe, actually. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, somebody's written here in answer to the food question. Uh, try the Environmental Working Group. It has a great list of foods, clean, minimal pesticide load, and uh, also try and buy organic. Somebody's written in. Okay, I'm afraid we are um, out of time here. Um, I would like to go on with this because it's a very big topic. But um, I want to thank everybody for listening today and for watching Cambridge Forum. Um, I'd like to thank Oliver Broody, who's written this book, The Sensitives. We have copy right here. It's on the website, the link. Um, and that's the sensitive is the rise of environmental illness and the search for America's lost pure place. I'd like to thank Stephen Bodian, who came to us from Spain. Thank you very much. And Dr. Anne Campbell. Um, and I'm going to put Anne's details on our website for anybody who needs to contact her with her email. So I'd just like to say Cambridge Forum is made possible through the generosity of Herbert and Dorothy Vetter. It's supported by the Lowell Institute, the Massachusetts Cultural Council, and First Parish Church in Cambridge. Thank you to everyone who joined us today online. A podcast of this will be available shortly on our website, www.cambridgeforum.org, and a video will also be posted on WGBH Forum Network on YouTube. And goodbye, everybody, and join us again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Mary.